What would you call a father who murders his five kids, wife, and mother-in-law? Well, if you're the Spectrum, a local newspaper based in St. George, Utah, you'd call him loving, excelling at everything he did, and one who lived a life of service. Obviously, there's several issues here, and I want to lay these out one by one because all of them are very important. First of all, in this specific case that I'm talking about, involving the Height family, there was a clear pattern of abuse and even child abuse, physical child abuse, that was not dealt with at all. Macy, the oldest daughter, who was 14 in 2020, had already told other adults who are mandatory reporters and investigators that she was scared to be with her dad and that she was afraid of her dad killing her. This is absolutely disgusting, and every person who did not do their due diligence during that investigation, including the local police and prosecutors, who did not charge Michael with anything at the time of the initial investigation in 2020, with that information should be held responsible for these deaths. The initial investigation for child abuse happened in 2020, as I just stated. Do you remember what was happening during 2020? I'm going to get into why 2020 points to a greater societal understanding, or should I say lack of understanding, in a moment. But right now I want to recall to you that domestic violence experts resoundingly repeated that domestic violence was going to go up with the lockdowns. When you trap children and other adults in a home with someone who is abusive, and then you take away their only moments of escape during the day, either through work or school, what do you think is going to happen? And then the inability of the police and prosecutors to do anything to protect these children who were outright confessing their fear of their father and had already confessed to the abuse that had taken place is absolutely unacceptable. Neighbors and members of the local Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that the Heights family went to described this family as a loving family. Once again, the triangulation methods that narcissists use to not only target and keep their victims in their web, but to perpetuate systems of abuse is evident in this case. I don't believe for a second that the neighbors or the members of the church were unaware of the abuse. What I believe is that they were very aware of it, but that their culture prevented them from speaking out about it or doing anything else about it. I think the local leadership of this church should also be looked into. They should be investigated. I have several videos on this channel that talk about spiritual abuse and the use of coercive control through religious or sacred texts, including an in-depth interview that I did with the International Cultic Studies Association just a few months ago. I encourage everybody here to go watch that. You can find the link to that in the description of this video. Any place where you are not able to speak up or speak out or have a conversation about what's going on behind closed doors is not a safe place, regardless of if that is a religious or educational or familial institution. I think the Heights family case so highlights for me personally and professionally the necessity of people to understand the nature of abuse and how you don't realize how it is accumulating when it's happening to you and the longer you are involved in that type of atmosphere and, and that relationship. Today, if you are in any type of abusive relationship, I want you to understand that today's level of abuse is going to be the least amount of abuse that you ever experience from now on. It must get worse because the abuser needs a greater level of supply tomorrow, in a year from now, in 10 years from now. Let's go back to the issue of 2020. Let's not forget that any type of coercion, anything that restricts your dress, your freedom of movement, your freedom and ability to make money and provide for your family, to receive an education are by definition, according to the U.S. Justice Department, abusive behaviors. In court, these things can be held up as abuse. These are legal definitions. So I want people to not forget that 2020, you elected people who, without any passage of law, decided to make you stay at home, dictated to you what you would wear in many instances, threatened your medical freedom and your ability to make your own health choices or risk losing your job. When you look at the behaviors that were dictated upon people by those in elected positions and you compare them with the definitions of abuse, it is gaslighting to yourself and to society when you make excuses for it. When you say things like this was done for the good of the country, this was for the safety of at-risk individuals, that this was to stop deaths from taking place or any other argument, you are participating in abuse. You are not only justifying it, you are furthering it. In this case of the Heights family, I have no doubt that the lockdowns exacerbated an already very stressful and high control situation. 
I wonder how many other families like this one are out there in this country alone, in that state alone. To what extent are we holding our elected officials responsible for the exacerbation of these cases? The escalation of abuse, the prolonging of abuse, and literally creating a trap for children who, remember, was one of the endangered groups or high-risk groups that the lockdowns were supposedly set up to protect, to experience heightened levels of sustained abuse again without an escape. What I've noticed, unfortunately, with these high-profile murders of children and either a spouse or a former spouse in situations where there was clearly coercive control and past documented cases of abuse is that there is a lot of chatter around how we need to reform certain things and how we need to work on things like gun control or we need to do something else. And yet there's very little talk around educating society, police officers, investigators of any type of what coercive abuse looks like. In the Heights family situation, we had actual physical abuse documented, reported, and filed with officials who chose not to criminally charge Michael. There are so many more cases where there is no physical or sexual abuse evident. However, there is plenty of religious abuse, financial abuse, and moral abuse. And when we fail to take cases where we have literal physical evidence of physical abuse seriously, we enforce the narrative to those in abusive relationships that no one will believe them, that there's nothing that can be done for them, that they need to figure it out themselves. What do you think this type of narrative does, not just to one generation, but to that generation who will raise another one? Do you think this is going to increase or decrease levels of abuse? Do you think this is going to increase or decrease levels of reported abuse? Do you think this is going to increase or decrease the amount of people who are held judicially responsible for their criminal behavior? The investigator's notes of the Heights family in 2020 showed some of what Tasha Height, the wife of Michael and the mom of the five children, was going through. Macy, their oldest daughter, who again was 14 at the time of this investigation during 2020, told investigators that her father would often belittle her mother, and he denied that. However, during his own interview with the investigators, Michael admitted to taking his wife's iPad and cell phone to surveil her text messages to check to make sure if she had spoken negatively about his family. I have done a video before on how to fix a society that is filled with narcissists. And in that video, I essentially state that everybody needs to do their part and become educated and aware of what narcissistic abuse looks like, sounds like, feels like, so that not only can they protect themselves, but they can help other people in their social network when necessary. Once that's done, the next level is to ensure that you are voting in people who do not only not display abusive behaviors and traits, but who will hold abusers accountable in the blink of an eye. The fact that we even have debates on if we should prosecute someone and charge someone criminally with abuse of a child when we know and have evidence that this is happening is beyond me. Our God-given, unalienable rights state that we have the right to life. And I believe that this means all life, including and especially children. Narcissistic abuse is very complicated. There are multiple levels and dimensions of abuse that happens when you are with a narcissist. This is why it's not as simple as get rid of the narcissist and then you get rid of all of the problems. And in fact, that was something that Tasha was trying to do. Two weeks prior to her murder, she had filed for divorce. So even if you can remove the narcissist, they have woven a web so far within your life and in every facet of your life that it's extremely difficult to unravel it, especially if you don't have outside help. Without knowing it, you can be thinking like the narcissist. You can be questioning if you are making the right decisions. You can be giving in to the pressures of your attorneys, family, social or cultural expectations and norms, your interpretation of religious scripts, and all of these will war against your true identity, which is telling you something is wrong here. But it's easier to shut down that one voice as opposed to these multiple voices that you can hear all over the place in every area of your life, speaking and questioning you and why you are having such a hard time instead of holding the abuser accountable. Finally, the real reason that I wanted to do this video is to point out how the real problem here is not just that five precious children and two mothers lost their lives because of Michael, but the real issue is the widespread influential networks that were activated in order to try to cover it up. I've already mentioned the fact that the neighbors and the church describe this family as very loving. Michael's obituary, which was again published in The Spectrum, which is part of the USA Today network, has been taken down now, but I want to read to you what it stated. Michael made it a point to spend quality time with each and every one of his children. 
He excelled at everything he did. After graduating high school in 1998, he was a sterling scholar in business. He achieved the rank of Eagle Scout and spent the summer after graduation working in Alaska in a fish processing plant. His leadership skills, values of honest hard work and determination quickly led him to be a line manager over a crew of 10 to 12 men. Michael was called and served as a full-time mission to Brazil for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Tasha and Michael were married in the St. George Temple on May 10, 2003. Together they welcomed five children into their family, Macy Lynn, Briley Ann, Ammon Michael, Sienna Bell, and Gavin Drew. Each of these children were truly cherished. Each of these children were a truly cherished miracle to them. Michael made it a point to spend quality time with each and every one of his children. Michael enjoyed making memories with the family and he lived a life of service. Whether it was serving in the church or in the community, he was always willing to help with whatever was needed. That is just a snippet of what the obituary said about Michael. Again, published just days after he murdered his entire family. Meanwhile, there was a GoFundMe account set up by other members of the family that bizarrely replaced Michael Height in the photo with Jesus. And I'm assuming that this was done in order to portray that the family was now in heaven with Jesus and not stating that Michael was acting as Jesus to his family. But nonetheless, both the GoFundMe picture and the obituary point to the fact that so many systemic issues are enabling abusive relationships in individual homes. The mortuary gladly published this obituary about a mass murderer, someone who clearly did actions that did not line up with the words that they printed in the obituary was gladly reproduced in the spectrum. It was only taken down after it started getting press and people were pointing out the discrepancy of memorializing the father as a great caretaker and provider for his family when he was clearly the exact opposite. This again not only shows that the systems are in place to erase and ignore abuse that happens in individual homes, but that the systems themselves are supported and run by other abusive people. I've mentioned before in videos where I talk about going into the court system and that you really need to approach this as the legal system and not the justice system. There are many judges, attorneys, guardians at litem and other third parties inside the court system who are other narcissists and who will be thinking in line with the narcissist that you are trying to divorce or have custody hearings with. Words mean things. Words shape our understanding around certain topics. They communicate our values and positions and our stances on issues. We use words to build businesses, families, communities, and relationships. When we start changing the definition of words, like when we call a murderer loving, when we say a mass murderer was always dedicated to his family and felt that each of his five children were blessings, not only is this gaslighting on a massive scale, but it actually starts to shift the way that we think about right and wrong actions. If someone who kills seven people in one day can days later be called a hero or a champion of the family, imagine what can happen when that same system is writing laws, choosing whether to enforce them or not, choosing legal definitions of what abuse means and when to enforce those terms, who to hire inside the system, and the precedent that this sets for everybody living underneath that system. This year, I'd like you to join me and label things as they are. Use words that actually define the experience or situation that you are having or witnessing. No more making excuses for why somebody is abusive. Call abuse, abuse. And second, please learn how to build a healthy life for yourself so that you can be a lifeline to someone who may need it later. I wonder how many times Tasha, Michael's wife, looked for a way of escape. I wonder how many times she reached out to her own family, to Michael's family, to her church family, to her community, and found no ally there for her or her children. We can only become a lifeline for somebody else when we are sure of our convictions and we are rooted in our own identity. So this year I ask that you join me and at least do these two things. Stop talking around the issue and call things like they are and become somebody else's safe space. Become somebody's lifeline. And if you're already doing these two things, then I invite you to either vote in people who are not afraid to stand up to abuse and abusive systems or become the person that we can vote in. Start in your community, start making a difference there, and watch your efforts ripple out. I've said it before, your voice is the most powerful thing that you have in your fight against the narcissist. The narcissist seeks to silence you because when you are silent, they can't be exposed. In this situation, you had a father who would rather kill his five children and his wife instead of getting divorced and go through the humiliation of what that would look like. 
if you want to end violent cycles, if you want to end cycles of abuse, end the one that you're doing to yourself. Find the places where you are making excuses for abuse, where you are tolerating abuse in your own life, and start making a change there. And never doubt the impact that you can have on your own family, your community, and your nation.